Mute. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us. My name's Susan McKenzie. I'm CEO at the Emergency Services Foundation. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And of course, this topic with grief is something that's uh, very close to our Indigenous um, friends as a group. It's something they're all too familiar with. So this topic came about as a consequence of a discussion with the ESF Work Well Learning Network. And interestingly, I was speaking with somebody yesterday who um, from DELP actually, who was talking to me about being an incident controller at a time when they lost a couple of their colleagues in fires down in Gippsland um, a couple of years ago and talking about how ill prepared he was for dealing with that grief and for managing people in his team um, dealing with that grief. So today we're working with Griefline and Griefline is a national not-for-profit organisation that supports people who have experienced significant loss and associated grief. Their aim is to inspire the national mental health industry in finding collaborative ways to prevent the escalation of mental ill health resulting from grief. And importantly, to normalise grief by having courageous conversations and supporting communities to grow from loss. I guess this is one of those courageous conversations. I'm going to tell you more about what Griefline offers in the way of services a little bit later. But in terms of questions, if you would put questions in the chat, then um, we will deal with those as we go along. And I would ask you to please mute. And if you haven't already picked it up, there's something crazy going on between my computer and the Griefline computer. It's the first time it's happened in all of um, in all of our lockdown working from home period. So. Amanda and I are having to sort of um, silence each other in between. So our presenter today is Amanda Trotter and Amanda is the business development um, manager at Griefline. And so she drives the growth of their knowledge, the organisation suite of literacy and education courses, workshops and incident responsive support groups. So she's a counsellor with a special interest in grief and loss. And she merges her clinical expertise with three decades of experience in content management and development uh, delivery as a former executive producer of high-end television and events. I need to find more, more about that, Amanda. So she's passionate about her role in developing a more grief-informed community who are better equipped to support each other through the very human and universal experience of grief and loss. So I'm going to hand over to Amanda now. And as I said, please post questions in the chat and we will come back, come back to those. So um, if you've got your camera on, you might like to turn it off so it's a bit less distracting for, for everybody um, as Amanda is speaking and, and I'll do the same. So over to you, Amanda. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you so much for that warm introduction. And um, I think we've gotten through all of our technological hiccups and I think we're going okay now. I'm still admitting people from the waiting room. So please, um, please excuse me if I get distracted every now and again while I do that. Um, but uh, yeah, a warm welcome to everyone. It's great to see so many of you here today and still more arriving. Um, and I guess I wanted to congratulate you all on um, basically your courage to come along to this session because, I mean, let's face it, most of us find the concept of grief off-putting, um, even though it's an inevitable occurrence for all of us, um, especially in the emergency services. Um, but your exposure to critical incidents and traumatic events means you share in others' trauma, loss and devastation as well, and therefore potentially um, even more grief. Um, so a big thank you to Susan and the ESF Learning Network for having the foresight to invite us to speak today. Um, uh, what it does is it allows um, us at Griefline to embody our mission to normalise grief 
by helping people become more grief informed. Um, what we want to do is, is help people to feel more confident to have courageous conversations about their own grief and others. Um, and a big driver for our mission um, has been the launch of our training arm, Griefline Knowledge, which Susan touched on just now. Um, and it works on two levels, really. The first one is the sharing of information um, around grief and loss. And secondly, it's our main source of fundraising. Um, we don't, we get very limited fundraising, uh, limited um, funding from um, government. Uh, so really we're using um, our, um, our knowledge to be our revenue raiser. Um, and I'll speak a little more about that um, and our short courses later. Um, but my primary aim today is to give you a top line understanding of grief and loss with a particular focus on its impacts on emergency services personnel. Um, I hope that it will give you that improved confidence to su support someone experiencing grief, um, including yourselves, um, and perhaps motivate you to become more grief informed um, uh, following on from this. Um, so I guess I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. Griefline recognises the continuous and deep connection to country of Aboriginal people as the first peoples of this nation. We acknowledge their displacement, disconnection and grief caused by colonisation and recognise their generosity of spirit as we begin the process of reconciliation and healing. We pay tribute to elders past, present and emerging and respect the collective ancestry that has brought us all here today. Uh, before I jump in, um, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, Susan has mentioned that you're welcome to um, pop your questions into the chat box. Um, we'll be running the webinar for around uh, 35 minutes or 30 minutes of presentation and then 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so feel free to pop in questions, comments or reflections into the chat box as we go um, and we'll try to pick them up later on. Um, so for now, let's launch into it with a little bit of background into Griefline. We're a national not-for-profit. Um, as Susan has mentioned, we support anyone experiencing grief and facing any type of significant loss. Um, we support so all of the, all Australians, um, anyone over to the age of 18, um, including some of Australia's most isolated and vulnerable community members. Um, and our aim is to provide a compassionate space for people to explore and express their grief without judgment whether that be uh, online, on telephone, um, via our resource hub, but I'll talk more about those, um, those uh, platforms next. So here's an overview of our care framework, um, which we've developed to align with the federal government's digital mental health framework. Uh, it ensures everyone can access support when they need it, um, particularly those who don't want to use face-to-face -face services or worry about stigma and privacy. We've always been, we've always had and provided an anonymous helpline um, and for many people um, that's, that's the, uh, the medium that they prefer. Others uh, are quite happy to book a call with us now through our booked courses service. So we're really offering services across um, that can be completely confidential or where we can know a little bit about the background of the person. So whilst we're traditionally known for our helpline, our help seekers are now receiving support um, via um, a range of platforms. In the preventative space, um, we um, offer grief and loss resources on our website, as well as learning programs through Griefline Knowledge. In intervention, we offer our online forums, um, the, help, the helpline, which is national toll free, uh, and, um, uh, and bereavement support groups, um, which we've started up this year. Um, they're going, they're be, they've become very, very popular. We offer them both online and in person. Um, and we're finding that um, we're getting really um, a good take up for the um, support groups and really excellent feedback as well. And for those requiring more specialised care, we offer bereavement counselling via phone and video. Um, and that's for particular cohorts um, of people, um, for example, in Victoria, um, we offer that via our police line service where we get referrals from um, Victoria Police. So thanks to this raft of programs and services, we're now supporting around 80,000 people per year. 
Um, and of course, you are all welcome to access our services. I'm not sure how many of you already have, but you're very welcome. Um, it's uh, obviously open to all and all, probably the best way to na navigate them is to go to griefline.org.au, our website. So let's take a look at what exactly is grief. Um, we we find there's a range of misconceptions about it, um, and you know really they only serve to confuse people and zap people's confidence, um, the people that are experiencing it. Um, so most people fear grief and try to avoid it, but in fact it is a natural and adaptive response um, to loss, and actually it an enhances our survival um, from seemingly unbearable situations often. Um, so rather than a passive experience that happens to a person, grief is an active process um, that we must work through in order to adapt to our loss. So most people have heard of the five stages of grief, um, denial, anger, um, depression, acceptance and bargaining, not in that order, apparently. Um, so we recognise these as common experiences within the grief response, but um, we also know that grief is very unique to each individual and it's completely un unpredictable. So some people might go through all of those five stages in a linear fashion, but really on the whole, that's not the case. Um, many people um, won't experience certain, certain of those phases and most people will not occur in a linear fashion, but they'll be jumping to and from um, the various um, experiences. And another misconception is that people should get over their loss. Um, so in reality, grief has no limit, time limit. Um, for some people, it might last three to six months. Some people, most people have adapted to their grief within a year. Um, but for others, it could last a lifetime. Um, and um, I guess so what we try, what we refer to um, or, or we promote um, is not trying to get over grief, but really trying to um, grow around our grief. It may always be with us, but we um, can, can learn to integrate it and, um, and fashion a new life around it. Let's have a look at some of the, um, of, of the various uh, losses um, that cause grief. So when we think about grief, lots of we often think about bereavement, of course, um, but it does come in all sorts of, um, of forms. Um, really, anything that causes profound change to our life and, and the realisation that something that we valued or cherished has gone, that would be considered a loss in the context of grief. So when we think of the people you guys support in the emergency services, um, they might be facing the loss of a loved one due to, um, due to crime, due to natural disaster, disease or an accident, or perhaps they've lost a home um, due to fl uh, flooding or fire, maybe a pet in domestic violence incident, or it could be um, the loss of identity to, due to sexual assault. Um, obviously the list goes on, but all of these uh, are the types of losses that can cause the grief response. And interestingly, the grief response after certain non-death losses can have a very similar intensity to the loss of a loved one. Uh, and of course, you as emergency service, services workers and human beings um, may have experiences, experienced multiple losses yourself, uh, especially recently due to um, COVID, um, which amongst other things um, has led to a loss of predictability in a lot of people's lives and, and has had an impact on people's jobs you know, or volunteer roles and just generally life. So how does grief impact us? Well, it doesn't just affect our mental and emotional state. Um, it really affects us across um, several spheres, um, psychologically, biologically, socially and spiritually. So a grieving person will go through a roller coaster of emotions and thoughts. Um, of course, the typical sadness, anger, confusion. There's also a lot of guilt. We see a lot of guilt come as presenting in our, in our help seekers. Um, there's avoidance and for some people there's relief and acceptance depending upon um, the relationship that that person had with that person or thing. Um, but they can also experience physical reactions. Um, we see a lot of sleeplessness, shortness of breath, nausea um, and, and often people will talk of pain in their heart, they'll talk of a heartache. Um, and everyone's experience is unique and so there's no right or wrong way to grieve. Um, and surprisingly, we find that um, one of the most 
um, I guess topical um, subject matters is am I doing this right? Am I grieving right? Is this correct? Um, so what we're really trying to, uh, I guess, inform people of is that our, it's all individual, completely individual to us. Um, and it's based on, you know, our, our childhood experiences, um, our mental health state, um, our support network and a whole range of things. So although it affects us all very differently, there are some common responses. Um, for example, separation distress, which can, um, I guess, be show up in, with helplessness, a sense of helplessness, um, actual pain and a sense of disruption. There's traumatic distress, um, shows up as shock or feeling overwhelmed, um, that, that the experience is not, um, doesn't have any meaning. Um, they might experience intrusive thoughts and feelings um, and just a general feeling of being on an emotional roller coaster ride. Um, helplessness um, can show up as feeling paralysed um, and feeling out of control, that, that the, the thought or feeling that you don't have control over your life or over anything in it. Um, as I said, guilt, remorse and shame is common. Loneliness is a really big factor and in fact loneliness is the second uh, most common reason for people contacting Griefline. Um, and the link between loneliness um, is very strong. Oh, sorry, the link between um, grief and loneliness is extremely strong. Um, anger and denial, a melancholy, um, anxiousness uh, and a yearning to change the past or the future and that can often um, show up in rumination. So going over um, the same thing again and again, going over the incident when the person perhaps um, passed away or, or uh, you know, when there was the breakdown in the relationship um, and ruminating on that, which can really be um, quite detrimental just to getting, getting on with everyday life. Also, sleep disturbances and insomnia are common. So how prevalent is um, grief and loss in Australia? So having a look at these statistics, um, and some of them is a little bit out of date, so I'll update you on those, but um, it, sh we sh it shows that a large part of the Australian population is experiencing grief each day and each month and each year. So when we look at the facts, Australia recorded over 160,000 deaths in 2020, and each one left around nine people grieving. So that amounts to 1.4 million people that are grieving each a death each year. Um, and then when we consider other losses that we've talked about that cause grief, for example, 150,000 divorces per year um, and the 2 million um, or nearly 2 million sexual assault survivors who've potentially lost a sense of safety and or maybe a sense of identity. So with these in mind, um, I guess it's little wonder that grief is now considered to be the second most common or common personal issue in the workplace. So there are several types of grief um, and they come, it, it comes in various forms. Um, so here are four common grief responses um, that I guess are not widely talked about or understood in the broader community. Anticipatory grief um, is a response to an impending loss and it's often marked by feelings of dread and anxiety. Um, it might affect people who are facing the death of a loved one in palliative care um, who perhaps have an elderly relative or pet and feel like their, their passing is imminent. Or maybe it's someone in a crumbling marriage. Um, so anticipatory grief does, um, does have that added, um, those added feelings of, of looming uh, disaster. So there is um, another layer of stress that's added to it. And then there's the ambiguous grief. Um, it's a type of grief that occurs when the valued person is physically present, but psychologically or emotionally absent or, or markedly changed. So examples might be someone that's in the grip of, an, of addiction um, or um, has um, been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, um, perhaps people with mental health disorders or acquired brain injuries. Um, but studies have shown that those in the emergency services are more prone to disenfranchised and prolonged grief. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit more time speaking about those. So let's start with disenfranchised grief and I'm just going to go play you a short audio snippet um, which we recorded from an article written by a paramedic named Alexander Jaber. So let's see if this works for us. 
It was still daylight when we arrived back at the hospital and it was dark by the time I snuck out to the ambulance bay, unable to watch any longer and broke down in tears. I felt so stupid for crying. The narrative in my head that repeated was, why am I upset over this? I should know how to handle these types of calls. I've done this before. It isn't my kid dying. I have no right to feel this way. I remember feeling confused about my reaction and wanting to shrink up and disappear so nobody else would see me like that. Looking back, this might have been the moment I began to condition myself into suppressing the emotions evoked from experiences like this at work. Several years later, I now understand that my response to that call was quite normal and even predominant in our field, but ironically, it's something we rarely talk about. To better understand the dynamics of this experience, we have to start by deconstructing a process we all go through but sometimes fail to recognise. Grief. Okay, so, so I, what Alexander expressing there is uh, probably more akin to disenfranchised grief. Um, so it's a response to a loss that's undisclosed um, uh, for fear of judgment or criticism by others. Um, it's common to first responders who often put on a brave face in front of their colleagues and families. Um, so they might be prone to conditioning themselves to suppress the difficult emotions that arise from these distressing experiences at work. And so examples of other incidents that can lead to disenfranchised grief include rape, um, pregnancy termination, domestic violence, um, and the um, uh, sorry and um, the, de the death of an undisclosed lover as well. Um, so all of these have two um, things in common, and that is um, the feeling of shame and a feeling of a, a lack of communal support. And prolonged grief. So if a bereaved person gets stuck in acute grief for six months or longer, um, they're deemed to be at risk of um, developing prolonged grief. So it affects around 10% of the population. And in fact, interestingly um, and unfortunately, that figure rises to over 20% in, in older populations. Um, but it poses significant risk to long-term mental and physical health. Um, and it, it's also referred to, to as complicated or complex grief. Um, so it often uh, occurs after a traumatic loss, um, such as a sudden or violent death, um, or a protracted illness or the death of a child. It basically presents as an inability to adapt to the loss and causes significant impairment to daily functioning. So um, it's often accompanied by intense emotional pain and it can look like a lot like depression or PTSD. So often the conflict stems from an inability to identify and um, direct plan blame um, on the, to, to the death. So it's often associated with guilt and over time, um, the person might turn that emotion in on themselves and ultimately blame themselves for, for the death. Um, it is closely aligned to disenfranchised grief because one often proceeds and follows the other one. The good news is that prolonged grief can respond to therapy. And in fact, um, we uh, uh, Griefline um, runs a um, program with New South Wales Health, um, which is called our, called our prolonged grief. Um, grief program um, where we offer six sessions of counselling to people that are referred to the program um, who might be experiencing prolonged grief. So that's, a, that's been, had a really great take up um, in, from our New South Wales help seekers. So what are the impacts of grief on emergency management workers? Well, this was an interesting, um, interesting slide to research um, because um, Emergency services workers obviously experience loss that um, the general public may never even experience. So, um, you know, wit witnessing the death of a patient or the trauma of a road accident or being unable to save a family's home in a bushfire. Um, I mean, you guys know better than me the losses that you face on a day to day basis. Um, so while there's an abundance of research into the high levels of PTSD and anxiety and depression and also suicidality um, amongst emergency service workers, there's a distinct lack of research into the effects of grief and loss. Um, so we think at Griefline that this highlights a tendency to medicalise the grief response 
um, to traumatic situations. Um, and we would like um, for that, for that, um, I guess, that stigma to, to be um, addressed to some extent. And for, for um, a perfectly normal response to something like that, a perfectly normal grief response, to actually be considered as grief rather than um, uh, instantly medicalised as anxiety, PTSD or one of those. But what researchers have found um, is that first responders are exceptionally good at compartmentalising. Um, so, uh, which is often what um, our counsellors will do. I know as a counsellor myself, I work hard at, at being able to compartmentalise so that I can go home um, and enjoy my family. Um, it's not always easy. The, bl the lines can get blurred, but, um, but uh, we have, there is data to say that first responders are, are very good at doing this. Um, the problem is that you can only ever do it up to a point and at which time it, is, it will likely become overwhelming. Um, so symptoms of unresolved grief um, uh, include a sense of numbness and inability to concentrate uh, and make decisions, altered sleep, sleeping patterns, lethargy, um, a change in eating habits um, and a propensity to self-isolate. And all of this can obviously interfere with your relationships, with family, friends and with your job performance. So how do we support someone who's experiencing grief um, and potentially help them to work through uh, and start to process that grief? Um, I guess if there's one thing I want you to take from today, it's that social support is the number one tool for coping with grief. So, and even more so for emergency services because their studies do show that social support is highly beneficial to the psychological health in an emergency services contact context. Um, so what we say to everyone is to go in, when, you, when you're wanting to support someone, go in remembering um, that you can't fix the problem. So nothing you can do will bring them back um, or fix the problem um, or, you know, bring back what was lost. So um, keep in mind that grief is a process, it has to be worked through in order to adapt to it um, and, you know, to eventually find a new way of living. So the best thing you can do is just be there for them. Um, and here are some tips for offering support. I wanted to um, go fairly deep into these today, but we, can, you, we go much deeper into them in our Grief Informed Workplace course. So if you're interested in that, um, we're giving you um, access to that later on. Um, but the, perhaps the single most important uh, tip is to pay attention to their grief. Um, people need their grief to be witnessed. So whether you visit them, them in person or you write a card, send a text, present, you know, give them a gift, um, it's, it just symbolises to them that they are valued and also um, that pays tribute to who or what was lost. And then we have offering practical assistance. So one of the most unhelpful things you can say to someone who is grieving is let me know what I can do for you. It just transfers the burden of decision making back onto them. Um, I, I myself um, recently lost my dad um, and I had, um, I had one of my tech savvy colleagues um, come in and offer to help me with my photo montage, um, which I really, really appreciated it. I found it incredibly supportive and it meant I didn't have to come up with one ways for them to help me. Creating a safe space. Um, so by me, this we mean suspending judgment. So you resist the offer to um, the pressure to offer advice. You know uh, we really don't understand that person's um, experience. Um, we don't have uh, all of the background as to um, what has um, come together to create their their grief response. So we've got to let go of any preconceived ideas about the right or wrong way that they should grieve. Um, really, what we're trying to affect is basically a nurturing space. Um, so to accept their unique grief experience. So that might be um, that might be chatting, that might be being completely silent. They may want to they may want to remain lighthearted, they might want to tell jokes, they might want to they might want to be angry. Um, it's all okay. We've just got to just got to go with it. Starting a courageous conversation. So this sort of sounds fairly obvious, but it's not it doesn't always happen. Um, you know, you want to validate your colleagues grief experience and show them they're valued and you want to do it as soon as you possibly can. Because if you leave it um, go, then it really um, can be very difficult to start the conversation. 
um, and it can drive a real wedge between the two of you. Um, and it also can force them to start to self-isolate um, because they may not, they may feel uncomfortable around you. Um, so I really, um, I really do urge you to start that conversation as quickly as possible. We want to humanise their grief. So we want to remember um, that part of processing the grief is expressing really difficult emotions um, and we don't want to really shy away from that. So they might want to express anger or despair or guilt. I mean, it, it, might, be, uh, it might be hours and hours of, of crying. Um, and it can be really confronting. It really can be to witness. But what we want to do is we want to try to reassure them that it's okay. We want to let them feel feel free to yell or scream or cry. Um, and if you want to, if you feel the same way, that's okay because people actually quite uh, it is quite therapeutic for people um, to um, see their emotions mirrored. So don't shy too much away from that because you don't want to hijack. Um, their um, their grief, but um, but certainly you know feel comfortable in in um, crying alongside them. And um, we want to steer clear of grief comparison. So grief uh, grief expert David Kessler, who um, we very much admire here at Griefline, um, he says when we start comparing, we stop caring. So we people do often uh, slip into comparing grief, whether it's their own or whether it's somebody else's. And I know. Um, I found myself doing that recently after the death of my father. Um, but we really, we really have to avoid doing that because, you know, another person's grief experience um, will be completely different to ours as we've talked about. So avoid questioning um, their experience. We want to validate their grief no matter what their loss. And, you know, we actually do have a lot of people, help seekers that come to Griefline after the um, death of a pet. And often they say that they feel that they can't, you know, they can't express it um, to friends and families, even though the, the loss of a pet can have um, an equal uh, grief response as to the loss of a, a loved one. And we want to say their name. So encourage um, the grieving person to say the name of a lost loved one um, and to tell, st tell stories about them, share photos or videos. It's really therapeutic to do this and it helps them to continue bonds. Um, with the person they've lost. So they don't feel like they have to, uh, I guess, negate them out of their life completely. Um, it's a really, really um, therapeutic way of, of keeping that connection going. And be mindful of anniversaries. So um, we suggest marking important dates in your calendar, um, like the anniversary of the incident, um, and also checking in with them each year or when that, when that anniversary comes around. Um, and be mindful that the lead up to anniversaries can be even more difficult than the day itself. So sort of try to be around in the lead up if you can. Um, also um, keep in mind milestone days, Christmas, um, you know, Father's Day, Mother's Day, those sorts of things can be really, really tough. Um, and the last one is remain by their side. So we talked before about grief having no time limit. Just remember that grief's like, it's like a roller coaster ride. You know, um, one day they might seem fine and then the next time, next moment you see them, they might be in free fall. And this can go on for years. So we just want to stick it out with them if we can. So what are the common barriers to supporting others? Um, it's helpful to, um, uh, to put in some um, time into preparation. So make sure you have a good understanding of the situation. Um, ensure that you also ensure that you feel supported and encouraged to offer the support um, and um, that it's not going to be too triggering for you and then you, that you can maintain it. Um, keep an open mind to suggesting that they may need professional help if, if you feel that it really is becoming too overwhelming for them and for you. Um, and also don't feel bad if they turn you away. Um, even on the helpline, we'll get people that will um, make a call, they'll have a chat and they just won't develop a rapport with our volunteer. Um, and so they'll hang up and they'll, re they'll call again and they'll connect with someone that they do d develop a rapport with. We always say to our volunteers, don't take it personally. It's, it's really got nothing to do with you. It's about them and it's about their experience. But um, it, it can be a little bit hurtful, but we've just got to ride that out. Um, and then in terms of, um, uh, in terms of um, 
getting ready to actually provide the, the um, support, you want to ask yourself, you want to do a bit of self-analysis basically. Um, you want to ask yourself, can they rely on you to be trustworthy and respectful of their privacy? Um, and really, you know, it seems obvious, but um, if you feel that you, you really won't be able to fulfill that, if you feel like perhaps you, you might be, um, have the urge to talk to somebody else about it, to talk to a fellow family member or something, then maybe it's not, you know, providing that support is not really relevant right now. Um, make sure they feel accepted and respected by you and that they don't feel judged by you. Um, people are very highly sensitive when they're grieving. Um, so they want to feel like they are on an, at least an equal um, level with you. Um, they, uh, and they don't want to feel like they're being talked down to. Um, that's, that's the experience that we, um, we see amongst our help seekers. Um, make sure you're willing to offer empathy, um, emotional support, um, that's gentle, considerate and understanding, um, that you can provide that practical assistance that we talked about, um, and that you have the conversational skills to help them clarify their thoughts. We want to look at um, cultural differences because they can also be a barrier to offering support. Um, so we can start by embracing diversity and inclusion. So go in with an awareness around the way your colleague experiences and approaches death and loss within their culture. Um, this really can bring great comfort to them um, and a sense that um, you really are um, interested in, in interested in their experience and um, and and really aware of who they are. Um, so you want to know the attitudes, beliefs, and practices practices around death within their cultural group. Um, so. Um, it's important to observe different cultural processes um, and we've got a, a list of the reasons why um, but um, you know it forms part of the mourning process um, and it acknowledges the reality of the death. It remembers the person who died and opens them up to the receiving of ongoing support from others. It also helps to process the pain of the loss and it supports them in their search for meaning around the loss. Um, and hopefully assist with the development of new of a sense of new uh, new self identity. So, what are some some of the practical ways of off offering culturally sensitive support? Um, open communication is key. So, you want to um, show genuine cur curiosity and sensitivity. Um, to do this, you want to make space to listen and learn. Make sure you've got, you set aside the time. Um, you don't want to go in um, with five minutes to spare and, and, um, and, um, and offer them support. Um, you really need to, to set out some time for that. And um, things you might like to ask um, might include things like what are their beliefs around death um, and what special days and dates are significant. You might also want to consider talking to them or talking to someone else who shares the same cultural background to learn, learn more about their, their customs and mourning practices. Um, so this might be someone from a community group, a family or friend, um, or perhaps a, a, maybe a pastor in their community. Um, some of the things you might ask would be what emotions and behaviours are normal grief responses within their culture and what types of verbal or written condolences might be appropriate. I'm just mindful of time, so I'm going to keep scooting through. Um, self-care. So I'm sure that you all know how important self-care is um, when you put yourself, uh, when you put others ahead of yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but it's also, I think it's always um, worthwhile, um, I guess, rejuvenating our self-care rituals or, or attending to them um, uh, again. So we've just got some top line concepts here. Um, firstly, to stay connected. Um, and hopefully this, pre this um, presentation has reinforced the importance of social support. Um, secondly, be kind to yourself. Remember to keep within your boundaries. If you find the boundaries are being blurred, it's sometimes helpful to engage in some inner dialogue, um, you know, asking uh, or talking to yourself and reminding yourself that, that their loss is not yours. Um, that this wasn't my patient or this wasn't my district. Um, you don't want to take on that burden of grief as well. You want to rest and recharge. Give yourself time out um, from your colleague's grief. Um, so maybe even schedule in time, in time to, to sit with them and, 
and um, join join and support them um, and then and then make sure you've got plenty of time to do the things that you like to do um, you want to stay active by you know with your favorite exercise and activities um, keep yourself healthy in mind and body with a healthy and balanced diet and please don't be afraid to ask for help so you can always call the grief line helpline um, because we do actually offer um, tips and reassurance for people that are supporting others. So you don't have to be experiencing it yourself. We're very, you're very welcome to call and get some more advice from our volunteers. Uh, so if you are in need of resources, um, I would encourage you to visit our website. We've got fact sheets um, in a range of languages. We've got um, a raft of articles on a whole range of topics. Um, and that includes everything from death of a pet, um, natural disasters. Uh, it includes uh, relationship breakdowns, um, uh, financial loss. Uh, and then we have some uh, links to meditations. We've got a smiling mind mindfulness um, recording on there. We've got an ebook. Um, for how to support a grieving friend. So many, so many resources on there, which you're very, very welcome to access. Um, and you can also, we now have, um, as I said, our callback service and our booked call service. So you can, um, you can go online and you can book in a call um, with one of our telephone supporters. Um, and we also have online forums. So for a deeper dive uh, into different aspects of, uh, of grief and loss and also loneliness, um, we now have our Griefline Knowledge um, uh, training courses. So we offer everything from self-paced online learning to group workshops and work workplace support groups. So on our website, you'll, you'll find the Grief Informed Workplace course. There's also an Addressing Loneliness course and our advanced grief literacy training. Um, and I'm really pleased today to offer everyone here 10% off these courses. So um, in the follow-up um, literature that we send to you, we'll provide you with a code and, um, um, and you're more than welcome to take that up. And this is just a quick snapshot of the, the various courses, the advanced grief theories, the addressing loneliness and the grief informed workplace. And like I said, it's all designed um, like today is just to um, help you to become more grief informed, help you to uh, have those courageous conversations and feel more confident both to support others and also to put to support yourself. And I'll finish there and open it up to questions. Um, thank, thank you, you Amanda. I catch you. Um, so much of what you said today really resonated with me. Um, you know, over the past few years, I've had a, a lot of grief in my life. One thing that resonated with me was an old lady who lived up the road from me, who every time it was my mother's birthday or the anniversary of her death, she always contacted me. And, and this year is 10 years since my mother died. And I still, um, you know, that was so important to me that somebody else remembered, you know, it wasn't just me. The other, yeah. thing, the other thing that resonated with me was I remember after my mum died, a very good friend of mine sat on the couch and it was only a matter of about three weeks after she died. And we were incredibly close. And this friend said to me, you know, for God's sake, put yourself together. And I thought, you have no idea what I'm feeling. No idea what I'm feeling. And yeah, I've I'm... never forgotten that. Ever forgotten that. And the other yeah. thing I'd like to share is something that I got much more recently. And there was a knock on the door and somebody delivered me a box with some chocolates and a bottle of wine and a magnet. And the magnet said, if you're going through hell, keep going but it was the note that came with the magnet that really resonated I'm going to read to you what the, what it said it said this magnet is a hand-me-down twice over it was given to me by someone who was aware of our health financial situation four years ago he got it from someone he knew when he was going through similar things and same from the person before him so it's yours until you come through and pass it on. And I thought, what an amazing thing. What, what an amazing thing for someone to do. 
That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing all of those um, experiences. Susan, I, I, I totally, it's interesting to starting off with the, with that gorgeous neighbour of yours um, and marking those anniversaries. And it's, it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. I know since I um, joined Griefline and, you know, a few years ago, it's something that I've started, I've also started to do. I've got a whole, a whole diary of people's, unfortunately, there are a lot of anniversaries, but I know I reach out to my cousin just recently on, on, on her um, aunt's anniversary on her mum's anniversary and um and once again every year and it, it, you just feel that it's like giving them a little bit of lightness the fact that they that they know that someone else is sharing in the grief experience it just lightens the load a little bit i think um but in terms of um in terms of the what what um that person said to you um you know three weeks after the passing of your mother which is incredibly incredibly soon but we hear that all the time susan um from our from help seekers and we see it on our forums as well and what happens is that people inevitably that's why they turn to grief line because they feel that they can't talk to people anymore they feel like oh my time's up you know i, I don't have uh, people have moved on, they don't want to hear from me anymore, I don't want to burden them with my grief anymore. So that's really, really isolating and that is a big, big part of the message that we're trying to get out there in the community is that we need to become much more grief informed, that grief will, grief will remain with us. As you said, 10 years down the track, it comes up, it comes up again and we need, to, we need to be aware that people all around us from day to day could be experiencing triggers and um, and you know reliving the grief that they experienced for years and years. It just reminded me of another story. Um, when I was working at CFA 20 years ago, my cat died and I was devastated by the cat dying. And I got a note, I went into work one day and there was a note on my desk from a guy who worked in another department who I didn't, wasn't a friend, didn't know particularly well, but he thought to write me a little note. And here I am 20 years later, remembering that kindness. It's, it's incredible. I saw a question there from Brett, I think it was. Um, are you aware of any bereavement groups or resources for parents that have lost a child to suicide? Yes, uh, I believe Stand by Suicide um, would um, be the would would fulfil that function. They work with the Jesuit Social Services, uh, and I um, am pretty sure. So what what we um, as part of um, this our wrap up um, document, we'll provide some resources, um, and I believe Stand by Suicide would be the best one in that case. For anyone, uh, for parents that have lost um, children, but not necessarily to suicide, Compassionate Friends is another a really amazing organisation. Okay. There's another question there from Mary. She says, a lot of my colleagues have a good understanding of self-care practices and the benefits of them. However, when experiencing low mood and or lack of motivation are not engaging with these practices. Any advice or strategies to pass on to colleagues on overcoming that barrier other than just do it? I think we need to, I think we need to show some self-compassion at times. Um, I think we need to realise that sometimes we're overwhelmed um, and that sometimes we just don't have the capacity to do that. And I think once, even self-compassion in itself is a form of self-care. So if we um, were to talk to somebody else, we put ourselves in, in, um, in the point of view of somebody else, what would we say to them? We would probably say, just give yourself a break. You know, if, you, if you're not ready to do it, if you don't have the capacity to do it, if you're not up to it, then that's okay. You're going through a lot at this time. That would be my suggestion. I, I, I was fascinated by the statistic that you said, and, and I, I missed the actual statistic, but when you think about it, the number of people in the workplace every day, you know, that are going through this grief, whether it be through a death or a separation or, you know, something to do with an older relative who's lost their independence or a health issue or, or whatever. Can you, can you remember off the top of your head, what was that figure? Yeah, uh, it's the, sec the second most um, common uh, personal issue 
to be taken into the workplace is grief and loss. However, that statistic is actually only referring to bereavement. So okay. when we add on all the losses that you've just referred to, Susan, mm. I mean, I think you would have to say that it's the number one, you know, most likely. Um, and, um, and the thing is that, you know, what, what happens is it, it goes into the workplace and then managers are often expected to be the ones to, to help and to support. And, and yet most of them don't have training to do that. So it's a very difficult situation for a workplace manager to be put into um, to support someone when they really don't have, then really uh, grief, not grief literate or, or grief informed. So yeah, it's another reason why we're trying to get our courses out there and, and, um, and get some training into the workplace. And what we're doing today so that hopefully through this, um, you know, then, then you guys are, are more informed and then you can take that out and it's sort of that train the carer type approach, you know, take out your learnings and, and disseminate that amongst your colleagues as well. And so Sophie has asked, do you think naming and recognising it as grief in the first place is helpful in itself? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're trying to say here, because often um, I think even more so and we think even more so now um, grief uh, is mixed up and misconstrued as a whole lot of other things. People might get a little bit alarmed. They might think, you know, oh, I can't get out of bed. I must be depressed. You know, I've got a racing heart. I must be anxious. We sort of medicalize it, you know, but really it's 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 a natural response we, that we our body needs to go through to process so um so naming it as grief can probably can i guess be a little less alarmist than medicalizing it and going straight on to these you know um more pathological responses okay um that's the last question that's there so i'll just give people a moment if there's any anything else that that they want to say i find this really really interesting because like i said speaking to the person yesterday who was an incident controller and the um at a major incident and the losses that they dealt with you know in the through the death of colleagues um we're just so unprepared for this you know, as leaders, as managers. I mean, we're training people to be leaders who are more authentic, more vulnerable. And he actually said that his vulnerability helped him deal with the people in his team because they could see how devastated he was by what happened. And it it helped the team, the team to connect. But I think we're just so unprepared. Um, um somebody, somebody could hear. Here. Recent studies are now saying that the second year can be just as hard as the first as people are expecting it to be better, but it may not be. What do you think of that? Oh, I, I'd love to see that study. Um, it certainly speaks to our experience um, and our help seekers experience. Um, it, unfortunately, um, you know, pro, the, the, the definition of prolonged grief disorder, um, according to the DSM, um, is anything over um, 12, six months, actually, six months. Um, but um, that's a very debilitating grief. Um, in terms of a more, um, I guess, a normal grief response, definitely um, it can go on, you know, for, for years and years, like I said. And, um, and in the first stages of grief or in the first, um, I guess, the first phase of grief, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of avoidance. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot to do first, first off in the first, you know, maybe three months um, and that keeps people very, very busy. Um, and, um, but then over time, when they get to a point where they really do um, the realisation that this person is not coming back, um, and this can be anywhere from six months to 12 months, um, then that's when it really can, the grief can really hit home. Um, they realise it, 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 it's a loss of something, something else, else. It's not going to be the same absolutely my marriage i'm never going to get my mar my marriage back um, um I, i'm never going to regain that that financial position that i was in when i was working that big job that i lost you know those sorts of things um definitely um that the realization can take a while to set in and once it does 
it's really, really hard. And that's when the processing has to start. I think we'll finish it there, Amanda. Um, Hegina's just put a comment that I like the reminder that we need to not medicalise normal human behaviour. Thank you for doing that, she said. Um, and so, look, I'll draw this to a close now and say thank you to you, Amanda, for a terrific session. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And as I said, we will put out an Impact e-news in the next um, couple of days uh, with the recording. And um, Amanda will follow up with some notes from today for those who are interested. So um, when the if, you, if you're not on our Impact e-news, um, go to our website, esf.com.au, and register for that, and you'll get the recording in the next, probably tomorrow. Um, so if you want to get on to that today. So thank you, Amanda, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Will you stop the recording?